and the scripture for the broadcast. We're going to stay in the book of Matthew and go to chapter 24 and get verse 20. And it reads, but pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. So the reason why this is a scripture for the broadcast is because, of course, this, the broadcast is titled Friday Night Sabbath. A lot of people may be under the assumption that the Sabbath day is no longer being kept or that it is done away with. But we see Christ speaking prophetically about the Sabbath day that we pray that our flight or our time of fleeing from persecution be not on the Sabbath day, the day that we rest, the day that we keep holy and gather with those of like minds. This is also a warning to let us know that the enemy would look to attack during these particular time periods. Uh, because we are resting, because we are gathered together, this would be the opportune time for the enemy to attack those true believers in Christ that keep the commandments of the Father. Also, we're coming into the winter time. All right, so these are the times that it's easiest for the enemy to come against us, and we must always keep that in mind. So we'd like to get your Friday night started by going into prophecy, news, current events, the things that are going on around us so that we are not um, ignorant of these things and they're on our mind uh, as the days, uh, as we get closer to the end, the days uh, continue to grow more and more evil. All right. And um, speaking of the Sabbath and praying that our flight uh, place on the Sabbath day, you had last Sabbath, last Friday night, you had an event that took place. Last Friday night was Friday the 13th. It was November the 13th, 2015. You had a attack take place in Paris, France. Right? And, um, you know, this event happened, and I'm pretty sure, uh, you know, very quickly a lot of people's attention went to the news and what was going on and trying to figure out what, what was happening. Uh, for those that listen to, uh, you know, our teachings and our broadcast, uh, you know, more than likely could have looked at the event and seen that this was uh, another event that was um, orchestrated and engineered um, by those of, uh, you know, higher powers, uh, those that are operating in the darkness that are looking forward forth to bring, you know, forward a wicked agenda in the earth. Um, you know, examining the situation for myself, you know, I'm not sure whether or not to call it a hoax or a false flag, meaning hoax, meaning that, you know, nobody died and it was all staged because there is some video evidence to show, um, you know, some, some violence and, you know, dead bodies and things like that. Um, but nonetheless, we know at the least sense it was at least a false flag, meaning that this was actually orchestrated and set up as an as an end to a means, meaning that the Hegelian dialectic, which is problem, action, uh, reaction, solution, they create the event and then they wait for your reaction and then they give you the solution. So what happens with these particular type of events is they cause all type of panic and hysteria and chaos and fear. And through all of that, they're looking for people to beg the governments for safety in order um, to give up their freedoms and their rights in order to feel more secure and have safety. And that's exactly what we have seen happen with these events going you know, all the way back to probably the most um, infamous event in 9-11, a lot of people are calling this Paris is 9-11. And um, only thing that happens from these events or, you know, one of the first th main thing that happens is more war. The the war drums, drums ratchet up, you know, countries start, you know, stockpiling and building up more weaponry and looking to go to war against an enemy. Of course, during 9-11, it was Osama bin Laden and Al-Qaeda. And now fast forward to 2015 with these Paris attacks and we have ISIS, the new boogeyman, 
that the whole world is terrified and scared of, right? Um, it just cannot be stopped. If they've come out of the, they've come out of nowhere, and they're everywhere, but they're nowhere. Meaning that they're every time you look up, it's ISIS, ISIS, ISIS on the TV screen. They're driving around the desert with Toyota trucks, waving black flags, you know, in, in caravans, and they but they can't be found. Um, these Hollywood production um, videos that they have. Um, you know, as soon as an event happens, they're always getting on, on on the Internet. They have all these, you know, social media accounts and sending out tweets and, you know, Facebook posts saying that they committed the, the crime and they can't be tracked through the Internet. But yet they're recruiting supposedly people through the Internet to come join their cause. And you have all these countries across the world, these big countries, Russia, America, you know, Great Britain, you know, France now, Germany, China, all these countries gathered together and cannot seem to stop this group that's come out of nowhere with, you know, how did this group get all this weaponry and all this, all these weapons? And, you know, it's, it's just, if you really start asking questions and, and examining it for what it is, you'll see that it is a bunch of propaganda and lies. All right. And again, this is for a reason. And we're going to go into some of those reasons tonight, along with uh, exposing this particular event for what it really is, which, as I said before, in the least sense, a false flag, that it was actually orchestrated and engineered by the New World Order so that the whole world globally can unite as one for a common cause to, co to, to fight against ISIS, Right. So let's go ahead and, and go into the news. Uh, just real quick before we do, also today, a week later, you have a situation that's um, developing um, as we speak in Mali with so-called Muslim terrorists that have um, kidnapped some people at a, uh, a hotel there in Mali. And um, they've sent in American special forces. And of course, with all this terrorism happening in Asia and Europe and even in some parts in America, they they could not leave out Africa, right? They have to have this terrorism thing going on in Africa. As we know, the scripture says, when you shall see Jerusalem come past with armies, then know that the desolation thereof is nigh. Jerusalem meaning God's chosen people. We know those people are there. Um, on the west coast and central parts of Africa. So they have to come in with their troops as an excuse fighting terrorism because they can't just come in with their troops without a reason. And we go back to look at the history during the times of 70 AD. This is the same thing that the uh, Emperor Nero did with the Christians who were Jews at that time, blaming them for the buildings that were burnt down and saying that these terrorists came in, these terrorist Christians came in and burnt down our building. So now we must go to the city and burn the city down and, and, and get them back. Right. This is what they've been implementing in the earth since that time. You had Hitler do it in 1933, blaming the rice tag fires on terrorists so he could go uh, to war and, and caused that war, World War II, and now we have what we're leading up to in World War III with what happened in 9-11 and now with these Paris attacks. Um, so let's go over to our first article. The first article we have here is off of activistpost.com. And it says here, Paris shooting. Ten ways it looks like a hallmark false flag op. All right. And the date for this is November 16th, 2015. It says the Paris shooting of November 2015, which just occurred on Friday, 13th November, bears many of the telltale signs of a false flag operation. Now, more than 48 hours later, we have some clues that the New World Order manipulators are up to their old tricks again, which are getting very predictable by now. 
Here are 10 signs that the Paris shooting is yet another false flag attack designed to scare the common citizen in France and everywhere. Demonize Islam, provide reason for governments at G20 and around the world to waste more money and take more liberty fighting terrorism, provide justification for the French government to increase surveillance, and provide France and NATO with an excuse to escalate violence against Syria. Parachuting false flag sign number one, drills on same day. How many false flags in recent history have all had the same feature? Drills at the same time, at the same or nearby place. 21st Century Wire reports that Dr. Patrick uh, Pillow was a survivor of the Charlie Hebdo shootings, who just happened to be on the scene at these shootings. That in of itself is a coincidence, but Pillow actually stated that a multi-site attack exercise, a drill, was taking place during the shootings. So we know that every time we see these events, there's always drills going on simultaneously. And that's pretty much all these events are, are drills. They are practicing and getting ready and conditioning the masses to accept being surrounded by troops, military on the streets, being checked at checkpoints, and being watched and surveilled at all times. Right? So the, the, this is practice. And then, of course, you have them going from door to door, checking people's homes because these so-called terrorists are still on the loose. We have to find them and, and, and take them out. So now you have people terror, you know, terrorized, you know, scared to come out their house, you know, being harassed and, you know, you know, privacy being invaded with people coming in the house and looking under their bed sheets and, and their closets for ISIS. And then, of course, it always ends with these so-called terrorists being killed. They never seem to be able to capture any of the terrorists. They always end up dead So because dead men tell no tales. Right. Let's go to parachuting false flag sign number two. Terrorist passport magically found. Stuart Hooper of the 21st Century Wire also reports that many mainstream media outlets, AFP, RT, Reuters, ITV, Sky News, AP, Fox News and Sputnik have been claiming that a Syrian passport was magically found at one of the scenes of the Paris attacks either on or near the shooter's body. Remember, the terrorist passport on 9-11 that somehow managed to survive heat and fire that could supposedly burn steel and landed unscathed on the streets below. Remember, too, the lost ID of one of the terrorists in the Charlie Hebdo getaway car. The false flag script is showing signs of predictability. So... I saw a video the other day. A guy made a video of, of, of satire saying uh, passports, the, the world's most um, indestructible item, and that we should start making bulletproof vests and bulletproof cars out of passports because for whatever reason, these passports seem indestructible. Here you have a suicide bomber who can blow himself up, but his passport remains unscathed. Or here you have these massive uh, structures that supposedly – collapsed from planes hitting them on 9-11 um, where the planes somehow were able to melt reinforced steel and concrete and bring these buildings down but the passport again comes out of the event unscathed and then we had the Charlie Hebdo getaway car with remember Charlie Hebdo just happened earlier this year in January in Paris where these guys had a getaway car and they left their ID in the getaway car so they could be identified as far as who they were that they were ISIS Right. So we see the same things over and over and over again. It, it just anymore. It's like, you know, it doesn't matter to them because most people are so numb and are so oblivious to what's going on, being, uh, you know, caught up in their own matrix, false reality, social media, um, selfieism, selfieism and, and narcissism that they could care less about any tough questions for the mainstream media when they come on with, you know, their programming um, to tell you what happened. And again, 
there's typically usually always no blood, no blood, no bodies, you know, no no people to to you know coming out injured. It's just a bunch of people on on um, camera talking and telling you what happened without any proof. But this is just how dumbed down that the masses have become. All right. Next next sign number three. Terrorists already known to French authorities. It turns out that some of the terrorists were already known to French security agencies, as the Daily Mail reports. French police are hunting 26-year-old Salah uh, Abdeslam from Brussels, who is accused of renting a Volkswagen Polo used by the suicide bombers who killed 89 people at the Bataclan music venue on Friday. It emerged on Sunday night that the French detectives questions questioned Abdel Slam as he crossed the Belgian border and let him go after he showed them his ID card. Detectives soon realized their blunder when they discovered that Abdel Slam had rented a uh, hire car abandoned near the scene of the massacre inside the Bataclan Theater. Uh, one of the hallmarks of a false flag operation is the way it is allowed to happen. People in high places have the power to direct, control, and call off people in lower positions in accordance with the overall plan. We're certain known terrorists allowed to gain entrance to France. Right? Were these people just allowed to come in? It seems like, you know... The government has all this surveillance technology, but yet these people always seem to slip under the cracks, right? We never can seem to catch these guys until after they do it. You know, they get, always get away with it, right? False flag sign number four. Terrorist declares he is from ISIS. As Brandon Turboville reported, one of the parachuters just blurted out, I am from ISIS giving us a short and concise soundbite which tells us everything we need to know about the killers. Is it just a coincidence that the Israeli Mossad intelligence front site, which have been busted before releasing ISIS material that was actually generated by Israel, were the ones to let us all know that ISIS is claiming responsibility for the job? And if it, is, if it really is ISIS, we know what this means. The controllers are now using ISIS and Western nations to further their goals. Bernie Suarez puts it best. Realize that as soon as they suggested that the attackers claimed they were killing for ISIS, given what we all know about ISIS, this constitutes 100% proof that the CIA and the West was involved because they are the ones who created, trained, funded, and ran ISIS. Realize that Exposing and destroying ISIS is exactly synonymous with destroying and exposing the New World Order. Which is why ISIS will never die. Yes, ISIS is now the lifeline of the New World Order. CIA's ISIS is now the driving force of the New World Order, and no one should be surprised that as soon as U.S. Special Forces advisors were sent to Syria... And the CIA's counter strategy against Russia began recently. Now we have this attack. All right, so ISIS is the invincible boogeyman that is everywhere but nowhere. Parachuting false flag sign number five. Terrorist states reasons for the shooting. Conveniently, we are also told in reports that one or more or one or some of the shooters scream, this is for Syria, meaning they were killing innocent French people because of France's involvement in aggressively attacking Syria alongside the U.S., Britain, Israel, Turkey, and other Gulf states. If the, if the shooters really are from ISIS, why not attack Russia since Russia has been actively bombing and obliterating ISIS stations? Russia has done far far more to destroy ISIS than France ever has why not a mas Moscow shooting instead of a Paris shooting however that's a question the mainstream media would prefer you don't ask or consider and I'll throw another question in with that is why hasn't ISIS attacked Israel being that Israel is right next to Syria 
Why is it that Israel hasn't had any ISIS attacks? Hmm. Let's go to sign number six. Shooting occurs right before G20 summit. Another highly strange coincidence with this Paris attack was that it occurred right before G20 conference, which began on November 14th in Turkey. Right. So this happened a day before the G20 conference in Turkey. As the New York Times noted, the official economic agenda in Turkey and Asia was already likely to be overshadowed by a series of intense meetings between Mr. Obama and his counterparts about the Syrian civil war. The refugee crisis in Europe, disputes with President Vladimir Putin of Russia, and ongoing tensions in the South China Sea. But the Paris attacks are certain to push even those topics to the side at least temporarily, as world leaders confront the scale of the terrorist attacks in the French capital. The leaders will grapple with the raising threat of the Islamic State. Now those behind the attacks, the same New World Order manipulators who are behind ISIS, will have the chance to push their anti-terrorism agenda onto other nations and leaders at the summit. Since the war on terror itself is a, gi is a gigantic fraud, any anti-terrorism agenda will be, will by definition also be fraudulent and a cover to centralize power and control. And what's also key to note is they released the new James Bond movie, Spectre. It actually shows this in the James Bond movie, meaning that it shows these um, false flag attacks that they actually show themselves you know, these intelligence agencies actually create so that they can gain more power, so that they can have one centralized intelligence agency and all the countries in the world unite with them and, and give them their power over to them. All right. South Africa was a country that was going against that group inspector, and then they created a, a bomb that blew up in South Africa to get South Africa's cooperation, right? So they're actually showing all of these elements in the new James Bond movie, <clears throat> which just came out a couple, a few weeks ago. False flag sign number seven. Shooting also occurs before COP21, Paris UN Climate Change Summit. This Paris attack, the second one in 2015, has occurred just 17 days before COP21, the upcoming Paris Climate Change Conference, scheduled to begin on November 30th. COP21 already has the horrifically ambitious goal of trying to craft legally binding universal climate change laws for the whole world. You can imagine the kind of protest and resistance that such a plan will be met with since it is a forerunner to a worldwide carbon tax, a world court, and a one-world government. Now the French government will have the perfect pretext to increase surveillance and military presence in Paris right before the event and quash any protest on the grounds of maintaining security. Right, and I wouldn't be surprised they blame everything else on ISIS if they don't blame climate change on ISIS and say that the weather and, you know, the global warming and the global cooling is all caused by ISIS. It's like everything is ISIS' fault. But now, because of this event, they can have troops uh, in, in large amounts on the streets so that anybody that's looking to protest what they're about to do in this climate, UN climate summit, climate change summit, Right, they'll now have full control to to uh, squash any dissidents that are opposed to this new world order agenda that they're bringing forth. Sign number eight, Charlie Hebdo precedent. The fact that another highly suspect shooting already occurred earlier this year in Paris is yet another mysterious coincidence to this November 2015 Paris attack. Many researchers have done a great job compiling 
evidence that Charlie Hebdo was a false flag attack. All right, and they have a place on this article where you can click here to see information on Charlie Hebdo and that being a false flag. Sign number eight, I mean, excuse me, number nine. As noted in the earlier article, Paris attack, November 2015, question everything. The numerology of this event is strange. Perhaps it is just a coincidence, but the date 11 15 as it is written in American English, is numero uh, numerologically significant, as is the fact the parachuting took place on Friday the 13th, with the number 13 being a very significant number for the Illuminati, Freemasons, and other secret society initiates. According to Vigilant Citizen, it was possibly foreshadowed on the cover of The Economist earlier this year. So if any of you are familiar with the Economist magazine that was released, had the magazine of Obama and Hillary Clinton and Vladimir Putin and all of these world leaders on it and had all type of strange, you know, imagery and pictures on it. But there were two arrows that were sticking in the ground. One said 11.5 and one said 11.3. <clears throat> and when you rearrange those numbers, it, it comes to 11, 13, 15. In a sense, a lot of people are saying that this was actually predicted and foreshadowed in this uh, economist uh, magazine cover along with other things that have happened and maybe still yet to happen all right but definitely the numerology is is definitely very key um, you have also when you look in the Julian calendar uh, November 13th is actually October 31st and what happened in October 31st of this year you had a a uh, a so-called Russian airliner crash in the Egyptian Sinai. And no sooner than this event happened, right after that, Russia comes out and said it was ISIS that blew up the plane. Before that, they weren't sure. They didn't know what it was. They, you know, were still investigating. But no sooner than this Paris situation happened, they came out and said ISIS did it. So look at the timing of how they program these things into the minds of the masses. They are meticulous with with their agenda and their programming, and their mind control and mind manipulation. Sign number 10, a long list of beneficiaries. <clears throat> there is a long list of beneficiaries who stand to gain something from this horrendous Paris attack, such as the French government, G20, Islamophobes, Zionist Israel and the New World Order manipulators. In addition to these, there are international and geopolitical ramifications to this. French military, uh, militarists and NATO who have been wanting to attack Syria will now have the perfect excuse to increase their military presence there. On the heels of sending their only aircraft carrier, the Charles de Gaulle, to Syria, which is leaving Toulon on November 18th for the Persian Gulf. Look closely at what will be rolled out in France and elsewhere in the coming days and weeks. Chances are high the elite will use this Paris shooting, which has all the appearances of a manufactured crisis and a false flag operation, to further the New World Order agenda. All right, so those are just 10 of what this particular article on activist posts points out as signs to show that this is a false flag. And people have to just seriously examine these events and ask some serious questions. There are just questions that, you know, just just don't make sense. And when you start to ask these questions and the fact that nobody in mainstream media are asking these questions or if these questions are asked, they're, they're being ignored. It just goes to show you that they have a script and they have a job to do, and that is to push fear and hysteria on the masses so that you, when the time comes, will be willing to give up all your rights in order that you will feel protected. 
and do whatever the government says. All right, so let's go to our next article. <clears throat> this is also on activistpost.com. It says, Paris attack foreknowledge and aftermath, November 18, 2015. With the dust settling, the fact remains that there is evidence of Paris attack foreknowledge. It's always important to question everything. It appears that certain people and groups knew in advance that the Paris attack was going to happen. Another indication on top of on top of the 10 false flag signs listed here. Major mainstream outlets have referred to the Paris attack as France's 911, which is interesting since 911 was a blatant false flag attack with plenty of evidence of prior knowledge, prior foreknowledge. Likewise, there is evidence of of a Paris attack foreknowledge too. Which will which will cement even further the very high likelihood this was another false flag operation. This article also takes a look at the aftermath and repercussions of the attack, which of course benefit those who planned and orchestrated this horrific event, in which over 150 innocent people were killed. Paris attack for knowledge. The first piece of evidence showing Paris attack foreknowledge was an incredible tweet date stamped 11-11-15, a full two days before the Paris attack occurred on 11-13-15 or November 13, 2015. According to Twitter, once a tweet is made or posted, it cannot be edited but only deleted. Various mainstream news outlets have explained this away as a tweet randomly, gen- a, a tweet randomly generated botch which takes headlines in text and randomly merges them into new, masked up and unreal messages. Some outlets claim the boot, excuse me, the bot took a tweet about the Charlie Hebdo attack earlier this year in 2015 and masked it with a tweet about a Nigerian mosque attack in 2014 and mixed the two. If this is true, it is an incredibly eerie coincidence given that they got the number of 120 killed and 270 injured so precise. However, Twitter was not alone with possible foreknowledge. Wikipedia, second piece of evidence, was in on the act too, with incredibly detailed descriptions of the attack up just two hours afterwards. So basically, Wikipedia had its own page up two hours after the event Listing out all the details. So you have to ask yourself, how is Wikipedia able to have all this information so fast on this event? Wikipedia also made a slip up in their version at 2306 or 1106 p.m. They write about an event yet to happen at 1158 p.m. As inspired to change royal reports, in the 11.06 p.m. version is this comment. In a televised statement at approximately 11.58, French President Francois Hollande declared a state of emergency and closing of borders for the whole of France. How could the writer report what President Hollande did at 11.58 as if it's a, a, a fiat, a comply, what he's writing it? 11.06 p.m. before it happened. Does this not remind us of the BBC reporting the fall of Building 7 with Building 7 still in the background? The fact that it was dropped from the change record also makes the article difficult for the researcher to retrieve. Was it dropped to cover their tracks? I find this circumstance to be so implausible as to establish the lack of credibility of the Wikipedia article. I furthermore cite this as evidence that the event was pre-planned. Another general point to consider in the immediate aftermath of the attack is this. How did all these places around the world 
get a coordinated show of blue, white, and red colors, which are the French flag colors, ready so quickly just after the attacks so they could participate in all the solidarity. The third piece of foreknowledge is that the fact the Bataclan Theater one of the main scenes of the Paris attack was sold by its Jewish owners just two weeks before the attacks. The theater may now be turned into a, a memorial of some type, but either way, it seems very likely an attack like this would destroy business. Given all the connections between Israel and ISIS, which stands for Israel, Israeli Secret Intelligence Service, is this just another, another astounding coincidence or further proof of foreknowledge? Here is a fourth piece of general knowledge in the Paris attacks, as, as revealed by the Times of Israel itself. The Jewish community was getting prepared in the months before the bombing for some kind of terror attack. Security officials in France's Jewish community have been warned of the very real possibility of an impending large terrorist attack in the country. Although there had been no specific information, according to Jonathan Simon Selim, a freelance journalist and a representative of French citizens in Israel. Right, so here it is. Jewish owners sold the building, this theater that the attack, one of the attacks occurred at, just two weeks before it happened. And also, the uh, Jewish community was looking forward to one you know attack of this magnitude happening in Paris it says for months um you see for months security officials and French's Jewish community have been warned of the very real possibility of an impending large terrorist attack in the country although there had been no specific information according to Jonathan Simon Selim a freelance journalist and a representative of French citizens in Israel the fifth piece of evidence is the CIA-sponsored meeting between intelligent heads of the four powerful countries running the Anglo-American Zionist New World Order, the U.S., Britain, Israel, and France. As you can see in the video, John Brennan, CIA chief, John Sawyers, former MI6 chief, Bernard uh, Beaujolais, French uh, Directorate for External Security Chief, and Yaakov Amadror, former Israeli National Security Advisor. As Melissa Dykes comments, funny how these intelligent bigwigs could never seem to stop any terror attacks, <clears throat> maybe because they're too busy planning them. So right before this event happened, you had all of these intelligence guys get together in a room and discuss how to stop these attacks. Right before this attack happened. All right. It says Paris attack aftermath. So what solutions does President Holland and France roll out in the wake of this false flag Paris attack? Why? More centralized control, surveillance, and war, of course. How else, how else can you stop terror? Or more accurately, how else do you stop the terror you help to create? Consider the following. Holland declared a state of emergency. France's national borders shut and mandatory curfew in Paris for the first time since 1944, according to the Associated Press. He deployed the French army on streets of Paris to enter any home, business, or building without needing the consent of its owners. He urged French lawmakers to extend the state of emergency to three months to pass new laws that would allow authorities to strip the citizenship <clears throat> from French-born terrorists and make it easier to deport suspected terrorists and called in general for changes to France's constitution to equip the state with new crisis powers. France is invoking the EU Lisbon Treaties, Article 42.7. This is a collective defense article requesting military help from its European partners in response to the terror attacks in Paris. EU officials say the mutual defense article is being used for the first time. U.S. politicians are similarly calling for NATO to invoke Article 5. 
Article 4 calls for members to consult together whenever, in the opinion of any of them, the territorial integrity, political independence, or security of any is threatened. Article 5 considers an armed attack against one or more members as an attack against all of them. Domestically, remember that France already passed a draconian surveillance law in May 2015, which mirrors the uh, which mirrors what the NSA and GCHQ are doing to the American and British people, respectively. Right. So here's the su- surveillance law that France passed in May. It says it allows the government to monitor phone calls and emails of people suspected of connections to terrorism without the authorization of a judge. So basically they can monitor anybody they want to. It's all about their definition of if you're a suspect or not. Requires internet service providers to install black boxes that are designed to vacuum up and analyze metadata on the web browsing and general internet use habits of millions of people. So now the internet providers have the ability to install technology monitors everything you do on the internet and to make that data available to intelligence agencies allows government agents to break into the homes of suspected terrorists for the purpose of planting microphone bugs and surveillance cameras and installing key loggers on their computers in exceptional cases the law allows the government to deploy what are called ismi catchers to track all mobile phone communication in a given area. Internationally, the geopolitical ramifications of the Paris attack may be massive. We we may be witnessing the early days of the call to war. The call to war, War III. Nothing less, based on the assertion that the group which orchestrated these Paris attacks is ISIS, not even its own country. How many people are going to fall for this? When declassified DIA documents show the U.S. created and founded ISIS and that France gave weapons to rebels that later joined and became ISIS. Right. So the proof is out that ISIS and any elements of ISIS were created by America and the West, meaning the European countries, Israel, um, Turkey, Jordan. Saudi Arabia, right? All these countries. And, um, you know, the right is on the wall. This is going to lead to World War III. And um, we're actually going to go into an article next on World War III. So I'm going to take a quick commercial break and play a commercial from Dr. Truman Burst. And when we come back, we will talk about how this will actually lead us to World War III. We'll be right back. Shalom, brothers and sisters at GOCC. This is Pastor Truman Burst, Master Herbalist, for over 50 years, helping all GOCC members, always at no charge, answering your questions about natural remedies and health. We're getting great results. Give us a call at 541-981-2520. 541-981-2520. Email Truman at HealthHerbs.com. T-R-U-M-A-N at H-E-A-L-T-H-H-E-R-B-S dot com. Skype is Master Herbalist. Ustream is Truman the Herbalist. In Jesus Christ's name, I pray, faithfully praising the Most High. Amen. All right, so let's go ahead and um, go into our next article here. And it, again, comes off of activistpost.com. And it says here, Congressmen ready to declare World War III in wake of Paris. Innocent civilians be damned. <clears throat> November 17, 2015. Insisting that President Obama is wrong to claim that ISIS is contained, 
Texas Republican Congressman Ted Poe wants to globalize the conflict by invoking Article 5 of the NATO Treaty. That provision describes an attack on one or more member members of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization as an attack upon all members of the alliance. So basically, if you attack one member of NATO, you've attacked us all. That's Article 5. President Obama is wrong. ISIS is not contained, declared Representative Poe, who on Monday introduced a resolution urging the administration to invoke Article 5. This is our fight, but not our fight alone. America should take the lead and urge a joint response as a body of nations. Poe's resolution may precipitate a conflict between the Republican-dominated Congress and President Obama, who has made it clear that he does not want to escalate U.S. military operations against the Islamic State. If the resolution passes and Obama vetoes it, this development would be unprecedented in American history, observes Fox News legal analyst Judge Andrew Napolitano. We have never, ever, ever had a congressional declaration of war and a president refused to move on it. Under the Constitution, Congress declares war and presidents wage war. Judge Napolitano continued, if the resolution passes, which may be very likely given that the Republicans control both houses and many Democrats may enlist in support of Post bill, then the president would be required to faithfully execute its terms by waging a war he has said he doesn't want to wage and he has said he doesn't believe is in the best interest of the United States. Napolitano also pointed out that the constitutional mechanism for committing the United States to war presupposed an attack on the United States rather than a reaction of fear because of one awful weekend in another country. This effort to commit the U.S. government to war by circumventing the president is a role reversal for the tactics used by President Obama in, by, in bypassing Congress to wage war in Libya four years ago. Acting at a time when Congress wasn't in session, the Obama administration assembled an international coalition to demand what could be called a U.N. declaration of war. In March 2011, the Arab, Arab League, by unrecorded voice vote, petitioned the U.N. to enact a no-fly zone over Libya. The League's resolution was brought about in large measure through a covert deal between Washington and uh, Riyadh, allowing the Saudis to dispatch an ex expeditionary force to Bahrain to help the Sunni al Khalifa monarchy put down on uprising, put down an uprising on the part of its suppressed and persecuted Shiite minority. With Washington's tacit blessing, Saudi troops assisted Bahrain's U.S. equipped security forces to massacre peaceful protesters. This was done once again to secure an Arab League resolution asking the Security Council to authorize a no-fly zone in Libya, which the public was told would be a limited engagement. <clears throat> As former Republican president contender Ron Paul pointed out at that time, establishing a no-fly a no zone is an act of war. To use a somewhat vulgar metaphor, once warplanes invade and occupy a country's airspace and the pilots are given orders to kill, foreplay has ended and intro mission has occurred. Acting on that principle, the Obama administration quickly abandoned any pretense of restraint, urging the Security Council to pass a resolution authorizing a range of actions going well beyond deployment of warplanes over Libya. The administration obtained a Chapter 7 resolution, the U.N. equivalent of a formal declaration of war. Congress played no role in this process. During congressional testimony a year later, then-Secretary of Defense Leon Panetta was asked about the legal basis for the administration's war on Libya, and if the administration believed it could act without Congress to initiate a no-fly zone in Syria without congressional approval. Our goal would be to seek international permission, Panetta replied adding as if by afterthought that we would come to the Congress and inform you about the progress of the, of the campaign. Once legal permission had been obtained through NATO or some kind of UN Security Council resolution, the president wouldn't need authorization from Congress, Panetta, a former congressman, maintained. 
Many Republican congressmen, Ted Poe among them, have been highly critical of the Obama administration's reliance on multilateral organizations and conducting foreign policy. Those criticisms often focus on the United Nations, an organization looked upon with special disdain by conservatives. However, NATO is an affiliate of the world body, as defined by Articles 52-54 of the UN Charter, which describes regional arrangements. During a March 19, 1949 speech calling for a Senate ratification of the NATO Charter, Dean Etchison, Harry Truman's Secretary of State, explained that the alliance was designed to fit precisely in the framework of the United Nations, that it was subject to the overriding provisions of the United Nations Charter, and that it was an essential measure for strengthening the United Nations. NATO was precisely the kind of entangling foreign alliance against which George Washington warned in his famous farewell address. Its status as an appendage to the United Nations should make it uh, disreputable to conservative Republicans, who in this instance are setting aside any pretense of dedication to constitutional principles in order to indulge their war lust in partisan animosity. Ted Poe's resolution may result in the U.S. government being maneuvered into what could be a world war, but that measure would not be a constitutionally valid declaration of war. This isn't surprising, given that many conservative Republicans embrace the view that the Constitution is a living document, where war powers are concerned. There are things in the Constitution that have been overtaken by events by time, insisted the late Representative Henry Hyde in 20, uh, 2002 as George W. Bush administration prepared to invade and occupy Iraq. Decla declaration of war is one of them. There are things no longer relevant to modern society. Why declare war if you don't have to? We are saying to the president, use your judgment. Having Congress declare war, how I conclude it would be inappropriate, uh, anachronistic. It isn't done anymore. Perhaps if Congress had been compelled to follow the and a chronistic procedure by deliberating the question of the Iraq war in 2002, the world would have been spared the horror and bloody chaos in which ISIS gestated. Regrettably, Congress revisits its mistakes to compound them rather to learn from them. All right. So we've talked about the UN, the United Nations, and how Obama sits at the head of the Security Council there, the only president to have ever done so, and how that's a conflict of interest. But you have to where the UN is basically world law, and it, would, it has the ability to supersede the Constitution, meaning that anything that, um, you know, the Constitution may say, if the UN um, says that, the, you know, that that group of nations are going to go a certain direction when it comes to a certain thing like war, that the Constitution has no, uh, has no bearing, right? And also you have these particular uh, situations like Iraq and Libya, to where they no longer declare war. They use fancy words and um, deception, saying things like, um, you know, um, we're going to cut cut off your airspace and make a no-fly zone and, um, you know, put sanctions on you. All, all of these things are acts of war. They're just they're doing it in a way to where, you know, it's kind of like trying to find a loophole in the law. And, and, and doing it in a way to where they can see them in, in the eyes of the public as they're following the Constitution, right? And you had the Pope come out as soon as this event happened and said this is a piecemeal to World War III, meaning that this is a, a peace, a pretext in the beginning of World War III, speaking to the events that happened in Paris, right? So you have to ask yourself, <clears throat> How is this World War III, being that this was a group, a so-called terrorist group, how does that make it a world war? Right. So, again, they're pulling you into this, uh, into, in, uh, you know, being, you know, bloodthirsty uh, warmongers as they are, because once there's an attack on your country, the patriot flags come out. Everybody stands in solidarity and says we must unite against whoever the enemy is. It's how it's always happened, going back, um, of course, to 9-11, going back to the times of World War II when Pearl Harbor was uh, was bombed, and then, you know, World War I. All of these wars 
there's a false flag that starts the war and, and people stand behind. So now everybody's pray for Paris, stand with Paris. Let's go, you know, you know, into Syria and 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 fight ISIS for, you know, what, you know, happened in Paris. But it's funny that they say let's go into Syria because I could have sworn they said ISIS was in Iraq too. You didn't hear anybody say let's go into Iraq. They said let's go into Syria. Right, to show you that this is a bigger a bigger thing going on here than ISIS. And we're gonna talk about that in more detail here in a moment. But this is all leading up to World War Three. Right, so let's go to the next article here. This is on activistpost.com. So what is this going to lead to also, along with World War III? West leverages Paris attacks for Syria endgame. November 18, 2015. The terrorist attacks carried out in the heart of the French capital, either coincidentally or intentionally, have served as the perfect point of leverage for the West on the very eve of the so-called Vienna talks regarding Syria. With its serendipitously strengthened hand, and with France taking a more prominent role, the, the West is attempting to reassert not only its narrative, but its agenda regarding the ongoing conflict in Syria, an agenda that has, as of late, been derailed by Russia's military intervention and recent gains made on the battlefield by Syrian military forces. The London Guardian stated in its article, Paris attacks galvanize international efforts to end Syria war. <clears throat> that the ISIS attacks in Paris um, have galvanized international efforts to end the, Syria, uh, the war in Syria with a new deadline set for negotiations between the mourning parties and for a countrywide ceasefire. There is still no sign of agreement, however, on the key question of the future of Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. So we have to look back to the fact that, you know, just a, just a couple of years ago, it was, you know, Assad used chemical weapons to attack his people. And then later came out that that wasn't true. That failed for them to overthrow Assad. So now ISIS is the new excuse to go into Syria and overthrow that government, take control over that land, and occupy it. It should seem ex extraordinary to the public, to the global public, that even after the attacks in Paris, the West still insists on undermining the Syrian government toward its goal of regime change, which includes continued material support to armed militants, all of which are extremists and many of which have either coordinated with or fought under the banner of al-Qaeda and even the self-proclaimed Islamic State, ISIS. This is also considering the fact that the Syrian government is now currently engaged in battle with ISIS in and around Aleppo and is currently threatening to sever its supply lines leading out of NATO member Turkey's territory. Regarding this point, the Guardian would even report it was clear, however, that Russia and the U.S. have again had to agree to disagree about Assad. The Paris attacks show that it doesn't matter if you are for Assad or against him, said the Russian Foreign Ministry, Sergei Lavrov. ISIS is your enemy. However, to explain the West's apparent failure to prioritize, the Guardian claims, ISIS, in their, the West view, is a symptom of political failings in both Iraq and Syria. The Vienna participants are to meet in Paris before the end of the year to review progress toward a ceasefire and the selection of delegations for the Syrian talks. In reality, ISIS is not a symptom of political failings. It is a result of concerted, immense, multinational state sponsorship. Entire armies of the immense scale, ISIS operates on do not rise out of political failings. They, are, they, they rise from huge pre-existing financial networks, region-wide logistical support, multinational political support, intelligence networking, and experienced military planning and organizational skills. 
The West and its regional allies, namely Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and Turkey, clearly constitute this immense multinational state sponsorship ISIS has so far enjoyed. A look at any map depicting the Syrian conflict shows ISIS supply lines running directly out of NATO member Turkey's territory. And in numerous reports, even out of the West's most prominent papers, it is even admitted that ISIS is supplied in Syria via Turkey. It is clear that then that political failings are not the cause of ISIS, except only in the sense that the failure to exact regime change in Syria has prompted the West to continue propping up ISIS and other terrorist groups until the government in Damascus falls. And only when Damascus regional and global allies abandon it. So basically, ISIS is just an excuse or a way that America and those that are aligned with America can have boots on the ground legally without declaring war on Assad and the Syrian government. And then they just call it a terrorist group um, in ISIS. Or they'll say they're moderate Syrian rebels that are fighting against Assad, that they're the good, the good terrorists. It says here, the, the West got what it wanted in Libya and created ISIS in the process. The West claims during the Vienna talks that if only they get their way in Syria, the threat of ISIS will subside. It's betrayed by the events surrounding the very rise of ISIS in Syria in the first place. Just before the conflict reached critical mass in Syria during 2011, the U.S., U.K., France, and other NATO members, as well as Saudi Arabia, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates, were already in the process of fully dividing and destroying Libya in pursuit of regime change. They insisted that regime change was the only way to end the bitter fighting that had swept the country. Regime change that just so happened to fulfill the long-held desire by Washington and Europe to see Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi ousted from power. Through arming what the West called rebels and through direct military intervention, which included large-scale nationwide airstrikes, naval bombardments, and even special forces, NATO devastated the country and turned it over literally to al-Qaeda. The West rebels turned out to be sectarian extremists all along. And in fact, with NATO's help, they promptly took their weapons, fighters, and cash to begin the invasion of northern Syria via Turkey later that year. The Business Insider would report in its article, report the U.S. is openly sending heavy weapons from Libya to Syrian rebels, that the administration has said that the previously hidden CIA operation in Benghazi involved finding, repurchasing, and destroying heavy weapon, weaponry looted from Libyan government arsenals. But in October, were reported evidence indicating that U.S. agents, particularly murdered Ambassador Chris Stevens, were at least aware of heavy weapons moving from Libya to jihadist Syrian rebels. There have been several possible SA-7 spottings in Syria dating as far back as early summer 2012, and there are indications that at least some of Gaddafi's 20,000 portable heat-seeking missiles were shipped before now. On September 6, a, a Libyan ship carrying 400 tons of weapons for Syria rebels docked in southern Turkey. The ship's captain was a, a Libyan from Benghazi who worked for the new Libyan government. The man who organized that shipment, Tripoli Military Council head Ab Abdel Hakim Belhaj, worked directly with Stevens during the Libyan Revolution. Belhaj, it should be mentioned, was the commander of U.S. State Department. This is foreign terrorist organization, the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group, which is literally al-Qaeda in Libya, and was so before during and after the 2011 Libyan war. Belhaj was also reportedly aligned with ISIS as it officially established itself in the shattered North African state. Fox News would report in its article, Herridge, ISIS has turned Libya into new support base, safe haven, that Catherine Herridge reported that one of the alleged leaders of ISIS in North Africa is Libyan Abdel Hakim Belhaj who was seen by the U.S. as a willing partner in the overthrow of Libyan dictator Muammar Gaddafi in 2011. 
Now it's alleged he is firmly aligned with ISIS and supports the training camps in eastern Libya, Herod said. It is clear that despite Western claims that regime change in Libya would be the beginning of the end of Libya's violence and instability, it was only the end of the beginning, and not only for chaos in Libya, but for other nations across North Africa and in Syria itself. Using another 9-11 to justify creating another Libya. NATO's intervention and regime change in Libya did not avert a refugee crisis. It helped create one. NATO's in intervention and successful regime change in Libya did not make the region of the world safer. It turned the entire nation into a breeding ground for terrorist organizations with so far unprecedented reach and operational capacity. NATO's goals in Libya did not prevent the refugee crisis that helped start it. And with all of this in mind, having seen this and taken full stock of Libya's outcome, the West has nonetheless moved forward with precisely the same agenda in Syria. In all reality, the West has no intention of bringing peace or stability to Syria. Their goal is to leave Syria as divided and destroyed as Libya, and to use the chaos and instability fostered there as a springboard for other targets of the West proxy warfare, most likely Iran, Russia, and targets deeper in Central Asia. The West promises that it will end the chaos in Syria, just like it promised it would end in Libya. It will not end in either. With Libya's fate in mind and a, re a repeat performance clearly taking shape in Syria, should the West get its way, it must be made clear that no matter how many innocent people are killed by terrorists, the West itself help create and perpetrate, they will not get an opportunity to turn Syria into the Libya of the Levant, no matter how convenient and well-timed these killings are, no matter how deep they are within the heart of Europe or North Africa, and no matter how tragic and regrettable the aftermath is. All right, and that's the end of that article there. And reading that article, what it reminds me of is the the interview that uh, General uh, Dempsey gave. And if anybody is familiar with that particular uh, interview, General Dempsey was being uh, he was being asked about what happened with the wars in the Middle East and what led up to that. And he said after 9-11, he got a memo saying that America would invade Iraq, would invade Afghanistan. Would invade would invade in Libya, would inv you know overthrow governments in Egypt, would invade and overthrow governments in Syria, in Iran, and all these countries that America had lined up that all these countries would fall because of what happened during 9/11, and then General um, Dempsey asked, he said, you know, he asked one of the uh, the chief you know, military guys uh, there in, um, in position, like, you know, well, what what are we going into Iraq for? Like, what are we going to the, into these countries for? And he said, well, and the guy's answer was, well, I don't know. It's just that we're going to do it. And um, so it just goes to show that they've had these wars planned. And even going back into what Albert Pike had stated in his letter to Manzini about the three world wars, you know, when you, when you go through their documentation, they have it laid out to a T exactly what we see unfolding in the earth with these wars, with Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya, Egypt, Syria, and eventually what they want to do with Iran. All right. So this is no surprise for those of us that, you know, have, have seen this information along with biblical prophecy, which we're going to go into some of that biblical prophecy when we come back uh, for segment two. But it's it's amazing how every place America goes, every place America you know starts these wars, it promises that it's going it's it's going there for this country's own good to get rid of these evil dictators and to make the countries better. But look at every place America has touched in these wars. It's only gotten worse. Iraq has gotten worse. Afghanistan has gotten worse. Um, Libya, Syria, these places are only getting worse 
and and you have nothing but terrorism um, that that springs up in its place. Libya, which was the, the the highest level of living in all of Africa, now is the worst, probably the worst place in Africa to live. How does it go from being number one to number two to to the last? You know, these are things you have to ask, and these are all promises made by your government, starting with George Bush, that they would go into Iraq only for a short period of time. I believe, like by 2003, Bush said that the war in Iraq was over. Yet the war continued. Things continued in Iraq. So you got to be clever because these devils are crafty when they say stuff. They want to cause these events and get you stirred up emotionally to support their wicked agendas with their lies and all the propaganda. So they can go in and, you know, springboard uh, their chaos and madness. And, you know, besides all of that, it, again, it's Bible prophecy, so it can't be stopped. These things must happen so that the end may come. But we have to be able to see these things for what they are so that we can show and tell others and, and, and hopefully open their eyes to see what's really going on and that this is all by design. This is not something that's happening just by chance. Right. So that um, ends our segment one on news, current events and Bible prophecy. We're going to um, take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to go to segment two. Um, we're going to you know read a uh, few scriptures and then we're going to go to the call line so if you have any questions any comments you want to speak about what happened in paris or maybe any other news things that are going on in your neck of the woods whatnot you can definitely chime in the guest call the number is 646-243-09 just press the number one that puts you into the call queue um we'll take your calls when we come back again this is friday night sabbath coming out of babylon here on blog talk radio the Gathering of Christ Church. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. If you have serious health challenges or just want a full body tune-up, then pay a visit to barakapah-naturally.org. Barakapah means bless and heal in Hebrew, and this is exactly what our holistic, natural approach to health will do for you. Your body has been designed by the Most High to correct and heal even the most severe illnesses using full body cleansing and detox protocols in combination with whole foods, herbs, natural supplements, pure drinking water and a stress reducing lifestyle, positive thoughts and prayer. We use tried and tested natural methods to identify and address any health challenge using a simple, easy to follow, personalized health program designed specifically for you. We can offer an initial one hour health session followed by a full 28-day follow-up plan which includes support by email, Skype or telephone. Further ongoing support is available as required to assist you on your health journey. We can provide you with a health and lifestyle education that will position you on the road to excellent health. So if you've tried all the hype, medicines, doctors and drugs and failed to get the results you need, it's time to do something different. Why not use a proven natural healing program that has provided great results for many that have used it? We're not here to sell you supplements. We're here to show you how to get your health back and keep it. Go to barakapahnaturally.org spelled www.b-a-r-a-c-k-r-a-p-a-h hyphen naturally n-a-t-u-r-a-l-l-y dot org
the truth will be revealed. Don't wait for the seven seal when the vial spill. We are gonna ride through the showers of tomorrow. Jacob's trouble is our problem. Joshua, we gon' rise. We try and go on the road, we fighting on his side. We are gonna ride through the fire and the rain. Trials and the pain. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. We're the children yeah. of the chosen nation. Israel, our father, but we don't even bother yeah. to learn about our history. Yeah. We've been through much in this yeah. They call us minority, when we're the majority. Yeah. So why you think they gave us jail? Trust in this history. Yeah. Suffering the curses, you can read it through the body. Yeah. Uh-huh. Chapter 28 yeah. to 268. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
people together. You must get the lost sheep together first, so that they can teach the Gentiles. Who do you think taught the Gentiles? Paul. Paul was an Israelite. So how can you teach the Gentiles when God's people are not together yet? That was the point. Now after the the decree was set and the disciples had their mission and they understood what their mission their mission was, then Christ said, Listen, go throughout the four corners. Teaching, baptizing all nations in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. To tell the other nations that if you all want to play on the right side of judgment and not fight against God's people and come to the truth and willing to follow the God of Israel, then you can be baptized. But you cannot operate as a pagan. You cannot operate as an idolater. You must denounce your God. You see, if most nations do this, they, their families will totally cast them out. You let a Muslim who was a Muslim all his life say, listen, I'm following the God of Israel. He's out of here. They, they'll probably kill him. Same thing if you go into the, uh, 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 where the Hindus are and he's in And tell them, listen, you must denounce your God. But this is what these nations are going to have to do if they want to be on the right side of judgment.
All right, Shabbat Shalom. We're back. Again, you are listening to Friday Night Sabbath coming out of Babylon here on Blog Talk Radio for the Gathering of Christ Church. We are now going into segment two. Uh, you would like to speak? Guest call the number is 646-200-4309. Just press one. We will take your call as soon as we go over a few scriptures. Just wanted to... Uh, touch on this uh, what we see happening with Syria and the Middle East being Bible prophecy we understand that the wicked that are in control of this earth they have an agenda but they're actually fulfilling Bible prophecy they're, they're fulfilling the most high's plan of what he said would happen and it's a reason that this uh, this will happen so let me bring in brother Sham Noah Allah Brother Shamdawa Allah, Shabbat Shalom. How's it going? Brother Shamdawa Allah, are you there? Shabbat Shalom, how's it going? I'm doing good. How's everything? It's blessed, man. I know I need to explain the Father is great, as always. Alright, that's what's up, man. That's what's up. Let's go to Isaiah. Um, Chapter 17. All right. Uh, We are in the book of Isaiah. Chapter 17, verse 1. The burden of Damascus. Behold, Damascus is taken away from being a city, and it shall be as a ruinous heap. So we understand through Bible prophecy, Most High said that Damascus shall be taken away from being a city. Damascus is the capital of Syria. This is where uh, Assad right now is bunkered down, trying to hold on to dear life for his people in his city. And who America and uh, all the NATO countries and their allies are trying to overthrow right now at this moment. But through all of this, uh, Damascus has been... Um, pretty much destroyed. I mean, it's it's a city of ruin. That's why it says it shall be a ruinous heap. When you go to that word ruinous, it means fallen. So at one point, you know, Damascus was a great city. It's actually one of the oldest cities on the earth. Um, but as of right now, Damascus is, is you know, not really uh, much of anything. Right, so they're going to continue their agenda to, uh, to you know, uh, fulfilling this prophecy, they're going to continue to have country after country um, come up against Syria, continue to try to get Assad out of there. And and if he's deep down in the in the bunkers of Syria, then they're going to level Syria to the ground, trying to get him up out of them bunkers. Now let's go to jo- Joel chapter three. Because when we look at the the, uh, the New World Order's plan in this earth and what's going on in the Middle East right now, we can see it, it lines up perfectly with the Bible. For those naysayers out there that, you know, are against the Bible or for, for those who are maybe sleep and need to wake up to the times that we're in and that, you know, playtime and, and sleepy time is over. This is what's going on in the earth right now. So, Joel 3 and 1, get that for me, brother. All right, this is the book of Joel, chapter 3, verse 1. For behold, in those days, and in that time, and I shall bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. So behold, in those days and in that time, we're living in that time now. The most ties that he's going to bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem, meaning he's going to bring us up out of our captivity. We were sold as slaves in the captivity. We're working for these corporations, uh, you know, in America and, and through other countries as slaves. That time of slavery is coming to an end. So in order to break us up out of our chains and break us out of our condition of slavery, mentally, spiritually, and physically, these wars must take place. Through these wars, while they're busy aiming guns at each other, we'll be sneaking out the back door, escaping to the Underground Railroad. Reverse 2. 
Verse 2. I I will also gather all nations and will bring them down into the valley of Jehoshaphat and will plead with them there for my people and for my heritage, Israel, whom they have scattered among the nations and parted my land. So the Most High said, I will gather all nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. So when you look at Syria and you look at all the armies that are now gathering themselves in that region, that is the valley of Jehoshaphat. But understand again what this is for. The Most High said he will plead with them there for my people and my heritage, Israel. So again, these wars are happening because of us. Remember Psalms 83 says all nations are gathered together to destroy Israel. Israel is a people. Israel is not that country in the Middle East that they're calling Israel. That is a United Nations created hijacking of that land by Europeans. Because as we continue to read, it says, whom they have scattered among the nations. What people were scattered? Those people taken in slave ships, scattered throughout the four corners of the earth, and sold as slaves in captivity. And it says, and parted my land. So that land has been parted. You see right now the Palestinians and the, and those uh, Jewish people that are over there, the Europeans claiming to be Jews, saying that this is their land. The Palestinians saying, no, it's our land. They've parted that land. That's not their land. That's none of their land. They're all Gentiles living in a stolen land, and they've sold us as slaves to the other nations. Now let's go down to, uh, there's more. I mean, we could continue to read down, but I want to get straight to the you know what we're talking about with this war here. Go down to verse 9. All right, Joel chapter 3, verse 9. Proclaim ye this among the Gentiles. Prepare war. Wake up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares. All right. All right, so the Most High said... Proclaim this to the Gentiles. Prepare war. So that's what's being prepared and declared right now amongst the Gentiles. All of these nations are preparing for war. Because of this Paris situation, the United Kingdom, France, they're all increasing their military spending and, and weaponry. Uh, their arsenal uh, is increasing because of ice, because of this so-called terrorist group ISIS. So the Most High is putting the spirit. See, they, they think what they're doing is getting ready to destroy us and wipe us off the planet and fight Christ with the angels when he returns. They think that they'll win this war. But little do they know they're being gathered into a, a area of the earth to be destroyed. Read verse 10. Verse 10. Beat your plowshares into swords. In your pronging hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. So they're getting everybody ready for these wars. They will be bringing the draft back. The weak will say, I am strong. Those people who, uh, you know, aren't in the military, you know, they'll be, they're going to bring the draft back because they're going to be throwing bodies into this war. People are going to be grabbing, you know, just everyday tools to fight with, uh, you know, there's not going to be enough guns to go around. So you're going to have to pick up, you know, uh, shovels and, um, you know, rakes and any, any hammers, anything you can grab your hands on to fight. Read. Verse 12, verse 11. Assemble yourselves and come, all ye heathens. And gather yourselves together round about. Give it call thy mighty ones to come down, O Most High. Let the heathens be weakened and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat. For there will I set, sit to judge all the heathens round about. So the Most High is bringing all the heathen, which are the nations, all of these countries, into this particular area. For war, you have all these these battleships and and um, jets and tanks 
and troops all being sent into Syria and Iraq, all of these areas, the Valley of Jehoshaphat. For what? The Most High said to judge the heathen round about. They're coming into this, this part of the earth to be judged. Read. Verse 13. Put ye in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come, get you down, for the press is full. The fats overflow. For their wickedness is great. Their wickedness is great. Who can understand the levels of wickedness and the plots and the schemes and all the uh, devices that they have? Just, just total wickedness in this earth uh, with, with the, their lies and, and, you know, killing people through vaccinations, their diseases they create. You, you name it. Everything that's, that's out there, they they got their hands in it, and they're the ones who's bringing forth all the wickedness in these earth. So the Most High is bringing judgment to them, because if not, we would all die. Read. Verse 14. Multitudes. Multitudes in the valley of the decision. For the day of the Most High is near in the valley of decision. So when we see all of these troops and all of these militaries and all of these nations gathered together here in the Valley of Jehoshaphat, understand that the day of the Most High is near. The day that Christ would come back and return to finish this, what they are actually creating is, is near. We're here. And know that as we go into the home stretch here with Obama's last year of his so-called presidency, that there's going to be major events that are going to happen to get this war kicked off. Because as we've always stated as a church, we believe Obama is the last president. He's number 44, right? He's that. He's their guy. He's the one that can do no wrong in the eyes of our people, right? And they need our people's spirit in, in, into America. It's our people that made America what it is today. So without our people there to support Obama, then what would America be? Because white people aren't supporting Obama, right? They're they're creating this the, this racial division now, race wars. Every time you look up, it's a it's a campus, some campus madness going on at this college and and then that college with, you know, uh, some type of racial division or a, a brother gunned down at the hands of the police, right? So, you know, this is it. Obama said that. In the 2016, his main goal is going to be gun um, gun control. That's going to be his main agenda for 2016. Before He said before he leaves presidency, his main agenda is gun control. So understand that um, there's going to be more false flags, big false flags, in order to, to bring this legislation into place. And that's what's going to spark this, the Civil War. When, people, when they start trying to confiscate guns and bring down gun control laws, American people are not going to give up their guns. And that automatically gives them an excuse to put troops on the streets. As far as Obama being the last president, you got Hillary Clinton. Now, any day um, when the time is right, they'll you know indict her for what happened in Libya. And she'll be out of the race. There'll be no Democratic nominee. Of course, Donald Trump will cancel his own self out because nobody takes that guy serious. So the only person that will be left will be Obama. To be president and there'll be so much chaos and craziness going on that uh you know that this is this is what they've uh is this this is you know what where it's headed so just want brothers and sisters to be aware that you know the time we're in that you know time is serious and you know we have to make sure that we stay focused and diligent to, to these things and not get caught up in the world and you know what's going on in the world and you know now they got you know nfl and nba and Major League Baseball stadiums now being ramped up with with more security and surveillance and 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 police presence now because you know they're canceling a lot of these European uh, soccer events because they're getting these bomb threats and terrorism threats. So this is this is the new face of uh, you know everyday life. Is that you know at any moment ISIS could bust out with suicide bombing and AK-47 spraying and kill up a hundred some odd people. This is what they put in in the mind and programmed into the minds of people. And we have to understand that that 
You don't want to be caught in any of these places where there's going to be large amounts and masses of people. That's a perfect opportunity for them to pull off a false flag and for you to get caught up in the chaos, in the d destruction that they have. You know, you're looking at, you know, prom events, you know, Black Friday, you know, the, these malls. These are perfect opportunities for them to unleash another false flag to get the American people riled up to go to war against ISIS like they did to go to war in Iraq behind lies of weapons of mass destruction. All right. So just wanted to say that we're going to go ahead and, and go to the call line. So let's go ahead and go over to the first caller. 